Hi everyone, this is Neil Reiter, consultant audiologist and director of ClearWax. Thank you for joining me in my latest demonstration video of our soon to be launched Waxcope. It's one of the more complicated procedures I've performed with the Waxcope. And if you would like to compare um, this procedure being performed with the iClearscope, I actually treated this patient a year ago. And I would say the complexity of both procedures are very similar. So you can visit my other YouTube channel, The Wax Whisperer. And it is uh, video number 1151. In fact, I'll put a, a, a link in the description so you can access it from this particular video. And the reason why this procedure is quite complex uh, is because of the patient's ear anatomy is extremely narrow and twisty and bendy. There's also quite a steep inclination of the ear canal. Now, most of our ear canals, adult ear canals anyway, um, as you enter, there is an upwards trajectory around 32 degrees, but I would say this patient's a bit more than that. Uh, in addition to the patient's ear anatomy, it's the consistency of this wax and keratin plug. It's extremely occluding and impacted. In addition, there's quite a few skin adhesions enveloping this wax and keratin plug, and these skin adhesions are still in part attached to the canal wall. So it's almost as though I'm playing um, tug of war with the ear canal um, to extract this plug of wax and keratin. Now a lot of people have been asking me when the wax scope is going to be launched and uh, the reason behind the delay. Um, I'm not able to say much if truth be told but all I can say um, is that around this time last year I got let down by a third party company who, uh, who I in, in, entrusted to uh, manufacture for me a particular component and subsequently I've then had to make the decision to manufacture this component myself. Um, obviously it's a steep learning curve, it's not something I've done before. Although I've manufactured uh, various medical devices, it's not the particular part that um, I got let down upon. So um, I had to do my due diligence, my research, but I'm glad to announce that the Waxcope is now officially um, registered and available for distribution across the UK and Europe. In fact, I just uploaded all the, the necessary documents and registrations yesterday, not only for the wax gate, but also for my new range of rye um, earwax instruments. Um, so I'm now just solely waiting on the completion of the new ClearWax app. Um, I've decided to wait until the instruments, the wax gate and the app are all complete before launching them all together. It just makes sense because all three uh, complement each other very well indeed. And um, I've waited so long already, I'd rather just now do a proper full launch. So hoping very early 2024, um, the app is almost done. So we're just going through uh, beta testing phase. So fingers crossed, um, this should be available very shortly indeed. Now, um, during the course of this video, I'm going to explain uh, why uh, I've developed the Waxcope, uh, the purpose behind it and the motivation behind it. Before I do, I'll just make a couple of important points. I know some people don't like watching videos with the Waxcope, and that's why if you're watching this on YouTube, I only upload the Waxcope videos on this particular channel, the Clear Wax channel. If you prefer the endoscopic videos using the iClearscope, please visit my other YouTube channel, the Wax Whisperer, if you wish. Also, there's a couple of comments both on this channel and my other channel of people taking offense to the fact that I'm promoting my own products and instruments and services on my own channel. Good grief. Yes, people are taking offense to, to, to that um, fact. If I can't promote my own service and products and instruments on my own channel, please tell me where I should promote them. Um, but nonetheless, if you object to that uh, vehemently and strongly, whether to the point where you need to, to leave some comments. Um, the last time I checked, you're not paying me a subscription fee to tune into my channel, so you're more than welcome not to watch instead of leaving kind of sometimes rude and silly comments. So let's get back to the Waxcope because um, uh, I am now going to promote my own product. So the reason why I developed the Waxcope is as the next best alternative to the Endoscope. Now, in my opinion, there's nothing better than an endoscope to remove earwax. Um, and that's because of the field of view an endoscope provides. When you use an endoscope, uh, it provides a wide field of view, a panoramic field of view. It's, it's like you're inside the ear canal yourself. And 
That, of course, enables you to uh, have increased maneuverability and visibility inside the ear. However, um, for all the benefits of endoscopic earwax removal, a lot of people, unfortunately, do struggle to use an endoscope. And that's for two reasons. The first reason is, is when you use an endoscope, you don't use a specular. So a specular is a hollow funneled object with two ends. Um, the end that goes into the ear is more narrower, the diameter um, and the uh, end that's more lateral and outside of the ear is wider. And the specular is used to straighten and dilate the ear canal. Unfortunately, our ears are not straight tubes. They've got bends and twists, narrowings and widenings, which means gaining access into the ear and then inserting an instrument can be quite difficult. So with an endoscope, you don't use a specular. So it, it's reliant upon the specialist using the endoscope itself to stretch and dilate the ear. And the way you have to do that is the endoscope is held in your non-dominant hand. And when you insert that into the ear, you have to apply pressure, gentle pressure, so um, patients don't actually feel it, truth be told, against the side of the ear canal wall. Now, fortunately, the outer third of the ear canal is made up of cartilage, and cartilage is semi-flexible, malleable, and it's not as sensitive as the inner two-thirds of the ear canal, the bony part now. If you apply pressure against the bony part of the ear canal with endoscope, of course, that's going to be uncomfortable for the patient. But when you perform endoscopic earwax removal, you only need to stretch and dilate the cartilaginous portion, the outer third of the ear canal. So you're having to do that using your non-dominant hand. And uh, concurrently, as you're doing that, you have to ensure the angle of the endoscope is projecting towards the wax so you can see what you're doing. And then once you've dilated the ear canal and you've stretched it and straightened it, you then have to insert the instrument being held in your dominant hand into the ear. And quite often, if you've got a very narrow ear, you, you also have to use the instrument to dil further dilate and straighten the ear canal. So you can see there's a lot of what we call bilateral integration, uh, coordination between both hands. In addition, uh, the endoscope has to be at a specific location in the ear in order for you to insert an instrument. If you're inserting the endoscope at a wrong position, for example, if you've got it um, in the northern hemisphere of the ear canal, then you simply won't be able to insert the instrument. It's going to be obstructing the access. So uh, with, a, with an endoscope, you have to uh, position it more lower down in the ear canal, which again can be tricky. There's a lot to do with both hands. Um, now, for that reason, um, a lot of people do struggle, and when they do struggle, of course, they can't use the endoscope, and they're then having to revert to other means of removing earwax. So the other means are uh, an, either an operating ENT microscope or um, head-worn loops or head-worn head microscopes. So what I'll do is discuss the pros and cons of each of these. Now... Whether you're using a, uh, an ENT operating microscope or a head, head loops or head microscope, the view is not the same as an endoscope. Um, it's more of a narrowed, funneled view, similar to what you're seeing on screen here. In fact, the view that you're seeing here with the wax scope um, can resemble the view you would expect to see with an operating ENT microscope. It, it, um, probably the only difference would be is with an operating into microscope, if you're viewing the microscope with your own eyes, you will um, have what we call uh, binocular stereoscopic vision. So you'll see the wax in 3D. So it gives you um, uh, a binocular method of depth perception. With most head-worn microscopes, not all, there is one on the market that does try to replicate um, the depth perception you acquire using an ENT microscope, but in the mainstay, um, when you use head loops, or indeed an endoscope as well, and also the wax scope, you get a 2D view. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have depth perception. If you've been watching my videos using the endoscope, you'll realise that um, you, you just obtain depth perception using monoc monocular vision. So instead of relying on both eyes, you're using... Um, one eye, ID, uh, i.e. a 2D screen, to obtain depth perception. So, Now, with an operating ENT microscope, 
uh, you get great magnification, but again, you get a narrow field of view, similar to what you're seeing here. And in part, that's due to because also you have a speculum in the air, kind of um, funneling the view. Um, and the anti-microscope is also very difficult to, to, to use and train someone to use it. Um, and, th and that's because you're having to acquire that binocular vision. It's not as si simple and straightforward as it seems. Uh, quite often, when people first use a binocular microscope, an anti-operating microscope, they get double vision. Um, they're getting two images of the ear. And you almost have to train your brain to merge those two images together. And of course, the cost and blueprint of an ENT operating microscope, they're very expensive and they're not portable. Um, that's why head-worn microscopes and loops have become more popular because they are a lot cheaper and portable. However, uh, the magnification with both is limited, especially in comparison to the wax scope and ENT microscope. And I've previously used head-worn loops, and if truth be told, I would really struggle to remove wax deep in the air now, given that the, the ones that I use probably weren't of the best quality when I, when I, when I, was, when I purchased them. I was, wasn't aware that they, uh, there were better ones on the market. I didn't really do my due diligence at the time. But I know they are better ones, and I have tried a few better ones. And yes, they are better than the original ones, but... I would really struggle even with those to perform delicate procedures on the eardrum. So if the wax is on the outer half of the echna, yeah, no problem, they're going to be more than adequate. But anything quite deep and intricate to remove would probably not have the confidence and I would struggle to do that. Um, also, another um, negative for me with both an operating ENT microscope and head loops is that there's a, a constant need of repositioning yourself or the patient um, to obtain focus on the wax. So both operating anti microscopes and head worn microscopes or loops, they have a very shallow um, depth of focus. So if you're examining the outer part of the ear and then the, the eardrum, you're going to lose focus very quickly because it hasn't got that range of focus. So there's a constant need of repositioning you or the patient when you're visualising other parts of the ear and removing part, uh, deeper and more lateral ear wax near the entrance. That's also the same with the wax scope. Again, the wax scope, because of the nature, is it's a, a microscope um, lens. It's not an endoscope. It doesn't go in the ear. The, the lens itself is external. It, too, has somewhat a limited and shallow um, depth of focus. However, the, the beauty with the wax scope is that you don't have to constantly reposition yourself or the patient. Instead, you just adjust focus either by uh, double tapping the screen. So we've got an autofocus feature, pretty accurate, the truth be told. Or you use the focus slider on the app. Um, you just go up and down. So uh, ergonomically, the wax scope for me is far superior. So um, the benefits of, of the wax scope in comparison to head worn loops and microscopes is the magnification and the focal depth um, and the, the depth of view as well. You can see far deeper in the ear. Uh, um, and the benefits of the wax scope in comparison to an anti operant microscope is, of course, the cost and portability. So there's loads of ticks with the wax scope. And for that reason, for me, I feel for the sole purpose of removing earwax, it's the next best alternative to the endoscope. Now, of course, you can accuse me of being biased. Time will tell. But I have really uh, road tested the wax scope. Now, one of the things I have to be clear about is the wax scope is, is not designed to make earwax removal easy. I, I, had, I had a couple of conversations with a few colleagues, a specialist, who currently wear and use head microscopes, and they they, they, they can struggle in certain cases, uh, the scenarios I've just described when wax is really deep uh, and also with the magnification. And uh, after watching the wax gate, they were really impressed by it and they really can't wait to get trained and be able to purchase the wax gate. But I somewhat felt that their expectations were a bit unrealistic. I th it's almost like they felt once they got the wax gate, then earwax is going to be made easy. It's not the case. Earwax is it's not easy to perform. It's a very difficult thing to do. So what the wax gate will help you to do is make the procedure easier, but it won't make it easy. So even with the endoscope, uh, which I use, which for me, as I said before, is probably the 
best method, in my opinion, of removing earwax. It still can be really challenging to remove earwax, as some of you may have seen by watching the videos. So I just want to get people's expectations to a correct level and plane. Um, there will be a period of adaptation as well. Now, when I, uh, of course, I use the wax coat quite a lot now and the endoscope, but there is a transitional learning curve, especially when you, and that's with anything. I think if you, for example, if you're driving a manual car and you revert to an automatic and vice versa, there's a period of adjustment. And there is nuances. There's, and hopefully you guys are, who are interested are watching these videos. I will do some online tutorials as well. But for example, we've got a slit at the roof of the, the specular here. Um, so you need to position that slit in a certain orientation for optimal insertion of the instrument. Um, obviously that varies if you're right or left-handed. Uh, you're having to hold the instrument from a higher angle of incidence compared to if you're using an operating microscope or head loops. A lot of you may just be inserting the instrument from a lower domain, a lower plane, which quite often we, we notice when we perform training on an endoscope from people who have previously been trained using a microscope or head loops. So yes, there is a, a, a few differences. You're going to have to change your technique. And sometimes it's more difficult training someone who has previously performed earwax using a particular method and converting them to a new method than it is someone who you're training from scratch. So and that's, and that, again, that's totally understandable because your muscle memory is programmed in such a way. So we're nearing to the end of the video now. And... Um, uh, when I performed this procedure last year on the patient using the eye clearscope, the procedure was, I think, about 16 and a half minutes, where so this is a bit longer. Now, I would say the complexity is probably quite similar, so it probably did take me a couple of minutes longer with the, uh, with the white scope. What benefits did I find with the white scope in comparison to the endoscope in this particular case? Now, I st I'm still strongly of the opinion that the endoscope is unrivaled, but I just found with the speculum in this case that it did help just to stabilise um, the patient um, and also the wax scope itself because it kind of locks it in place, which is great. Um, if someone was to ask me what I would use um, in complex cases, more often than not, I would use the endoscope. However, there was a case, and I'll, I will try and upload it um, the next week or so, where I started off using, it was a quite a complex case, I started off with the wax scope, and there came a point where I was struggling a bit, so I reverted back to the eye clear scope, but I then felt, I was also struggling with the eye clear scope, and I felt actually I'd be better removing this with the wax scope, I just felt more comfortable, and I went back to the wax scope. It's the first time I've ever had to really revert from the endoscope to the wax scope to complete a procedure. So I was really chuffed with that, as you can imagine. Nice and clear, you can see this patient's got quite a, a, a bony spur near to the eardrum. And if you, again, watch the other video using the eye clear scope, it'll probably be a bit more noticeable because you can see the whole ear canal as a perspective. That was all the dead skin debris that I removed. I hope you enjoyed that video, guys. If you are interested in the wax scope, please do email info at clearwax.co.uk. Bye.